and we're talking with Mr. Bill Neal Sayer, the author of the book, I'm Dying Up Here, <laughs> the story of the 1979 comedian strike. Bill, why did you want to write this story? Well, I, was, I covered the, uh, the comedy business uh, for the LA Times back then. Uh, I was a cub reporter, and, and I had been given this uh, amazing assignment to cover the comedy club scene and for the LA Times. Uh, and what had taken place right before I was given this, this assignment was that there had been this sort of secret invisible migration that happened in the United States. One by one, all the class clowns all across America picked up and left home and moved to Los Angeles because they had been sitting, and they all tell the same story, they'd been sitting at home watching Johnny Carson and he introduced some funny comic and they said he's performing here in town at the comedy store and one by one all these comics said I gotta go there, I gotta perform at the comedy store and I gotta get on the Carson show because I want to be a comedian and you know they they just all picked up and left home and within you know a year or two there was 300 young struggling comics living in Los Angeles trying to get on at the Comedy Store, uh, and it was sex, drugs, rock and roll, and jokes, and it was a <laughs> wonderful time, and I was just given the opportunity to cover this, uh, and I had just moved to Los Angeles around the same time myself, I would migrated, and so I, I was meeting the comedians, I, my job was to find out what was happening in the scene, go to the clubs, find out who's hot, who's going to be the next Robin Williams, who's going to emerge out of the club scene, uh, and I got to know everybody, and, and then the strike came along, and it sort of took things in a different direction. But it was, it was an amazing time. Um, what, what caused me to, to, and I covered the strike for the Los Angeles Times, I think the Times was the only uh, newspaper that, that covered the, the strike, you know. Well, they had the Intermountain Jewish News, too. Well, that's, that's true, yeah, I'm sure. But then we, we can't find those clips anymore. Uh, but... Uh, uh, so we covered, I covered it, and, you know, back then the, the L.A. Times was so rich and uh, uh, successful that they could afford to have a, a reporter on the comedy beat. I mean, imagine that, you know. Right. Yeah, they devoted voted by full time to it. So uh, I covered the strike, and then I, I, I uh, covered the, the unfortunate incident having to do with a comedian named Steve Lubetkin. Um, and... Uh, I let it go after that. After, after, after all that was over, the strike was over and all that, I, I went to another beat. And 30 years passed, or approximately that, and one day I was, um, I was reading in the LA Times and I saw an obit of George Miller. And I, I, I was, first of all, surprised. I said, you know, George Miller's 61, you know, on Letterman a lot was the headline. And I was surprised to see that that George had died and that he was that old and that I was therefore that old and so much time had, had passed, you know, and I remembered talking to George and I was, you know, thinking all this stuff. And it said in the paper that there was going to be a public memorial for George at the Laugh Factory. So I thought, wow, you know, uh, I wonder if all the guys will show up for that. Tell all the people from back then or how many of them will. And just, just out, I just decided I would go and see, just out of curiosity. And I walked into the Laugh Factory on a Sunday afternoon, 30 years after this strike. And there they all were. Not everybody, but an awful lot of them. Leno was there. The only reason Letterman wasn't there was because he was in the hospital or he would have been there. Uh, Richard Lewis, uh, people who had not been in the same room with one another, in some cases, since the strike. And some of the guys who had crossed the picket line were there, too. And they were over there. And the other guys were over here. And when, when everybody got up to say their stuff about George, you know, their remembrances of George that they'd known for many, many years, every person, without fail, what, what they talked about and the anecdotes they told were all of the period 1975 to 79. And clearly they all saw that as the time of their life. That's when their best memories were, you know, and it was a time when they were all really struggling. And that's why I decided, wow, I should, I should write a book about this because it's, you know, it's, a, it's actually a better story now viewed from middle age than it was then. <laughs> yeah, it was hell then.